Justified City Primeval Final Episode Title, The Question, concludes with what appears to be a clear conclusion as we witness the man in the hat surrender both his badge and his gun. Raylan has been killing, saving lives and acting as a lawman for a few decades. But according to City Primeval, the Detroit case and the Oklahoma Wildman are what eventually push Raylan over the edge and make him the kind of person he doesn't want to be. He is no longer that person. He no longer believes that the ends warrant the means. He is no longer that person who would act unethically and think nothing of it. He now resembles Tommy Lee Jones from No Country for Old Men, worn out and fatigued. It's difficult to even assess the criminality you see now, Ed Tom Bell said in his speech. Not because I'm terrified of it. I've always known that in order to accomplish this job, you must be willing to die. But I don't want to go out and meet something I don't comprehend by pushing my chips forward. A man would have to jeopardize his soul. So allow me to ask you another, do you purchase this for Raylan? Consider Sandy and Sweetie, Judge Guy and the Detroit Police Department, Willa and the Albanians, and the other couples Clement and Carolyn. Can you accept this conclusion for Raylan, Harlan's most troubled son, based on the way City Primeval writes Raylan, these characters in this case? Sincerely, I don't believe that what occurs in Detroit, or even the manner in which Clement is killed, is exceptional or unusual enough to prompt Raylan's response in this manner. On the first season of Justified, we saw him go through and do worse, so I'm still not persuaded that this is his turning point. Clarifying whether Raylan is repulsed ashamed of his own deeds and what they indicate about his old nature, showing through or disgusted and indifferent in finding other criminals as careless and as merciless as Clement is difficult for City Promabel to do, especially in this episode's final act. Of course, it may be either, and it's possible that City Primeval doesn't take a position because it wants to acknowledge Raylan's past experiences and how they might have affected him now. Because I am a kind recapper, I will give the show the benefit of the doubt there. And despite that ambiguous writing, Timothy Oliphant is such a skilled actor that he successfully conveys Raylan's unease and exhaustion, regardless of its origin. The expression on his face when he receives the urgent call from the marshal's office and the breaking news alert regarding Boyd's escape, yep, it was me you heard screaming. Oliphant did a fantastic job of capturing Raylan's bewilderment and perhaps just perhaps enthusiasm. If that had been the beginning of City Primeval Man, we would have been boiling with gas or using coal, which they dug collectively. There are several storylines to get through before we're tempted with a Raylan slash Boyd reunion. So let's go back and talk about the question chronologically. We continue off where the smoking gun, the previous episode, left off with Raylan and Clement being taken to Skender's apartment in Panic Room, where Carolyn is waiting by Toma and his Albanian team. She was serious when she said she would no longer represent Clement, and she and Toma have agreed to keep Clement in the room, where he broke Skender's leg and never let him out. Raylan assists in lowering the door to the soundproof Panic Room, where Clement will starve to death since he is sick of hearing his bullshit. In Carolyn's words, the world's better off. This is retribution for Skender and Sweetie. While Clement is wrecking things in the panic room and exhibiting his first true sign of, well, panic, Carolyn and Raylan are both moving in different directions. The former is visiting Michigan's lieutenant governor to argue why she should be appointed as Judge Guy, because she isn't dirtier than the Playboy Mansion Jacuzzi, and the latter is teaming up with the DPD's Wendell and Brawl to take on Maureen. Maureen, however, proves to be every bit as obnoxious as Clement, literally having a temper tantrum in front of internal affairs while joking that her fellow soldiers have nothing on her other than some scribblings in some book. Thanks to City Primeval for allowing women to be horrible too. I guess this is a victory for feminism. But Maureen's breakdown here only left me with more unanswered issues, especially because the question leaves it unclear what will happen to Maureen, Judge Guy's book, or the DPD corruption. In our flash forward, Raylan's stay in Detroit is only referred to as a big pile of mess. Perhaps I missed it. Would a brief full circle ending have been satisfying in this situation? Probably. Instead, Clement is the focus of the question's middle section, which Brawl, in one of his best lines, calls. Skender loses all sense of masculinity and honor and resolves to kill his attacker, leaving him beaten to death and Clement free from prison, even though Clement was undoubtedly going to die in that makeshift cell. When Raylan enters the panic room to release Clement, because according to Carolyn's Raylan, his own morals forbid him from doing so, he discovers Skender's body and learns that Clement will now seek out Toma, Carolyn, and him. Raylan phones Carolyn just in time to get her out of the house, but the Albanians are not so lucky. 
Clement slaughters many of them in the Venus, including Toma. The long-awaited encounter between Clement and Raylan will then take place, which is fine. Look, I agree that Clement's terrible music needs to stop being broadcast around the world. In that regard, it could be said that Raylan performed a public service by murdering him before he could play the cassette. In addition, City Primeval has done a wonderful job of demonstrating Raylan's affection for Carolyn. When combined with the resentment Raylan already harbored towards Clement for deceiving Willa, I think that his literal trigger would go off. Though perhaps Raylan and Clement should have conversed more, there was something about this scene that obscured the significance of this occasion. Perhaps Clement never took his aspirations for a career in music seriously. Maybe the pace wasn't right, or Carolyn arriving at her house in time to see Clement's passing felt too orderly. In either case, Clement asks Raylan, what do you kill me for? before departing this realm. And six weeks later, when Raylan is back in Miami and is present for Marshal Dan Grant's retirement celebration, that question still bothers him. Grant is aware that Raylan has changed since the events in Detroit, but Raylan's shift into Minor contradicts what Grant interprets as a newfound maturity that would help Raylan in his role as chief. He informs none of his ex-wife Winona, Dan, Carolyn, or Willa of his decision to leave the Marshal service. Winona tells Raylan, if you couldn't do it for me, I'm glad you could do it for her. But is he truly doing it for Willa? They'll have more time together now, but I didn't perceive Raylan's behavior as having anything to do specifically with the worst keen driver since Cher Horowitz. And whether Raylan will truly follow through on his retirement, now that Boyd has planned an escape from Tramble during a hospital transfer, speeding off to Mexico in his typical button-to-the-neck shirt, and with a besotted jail guard by his side, I have my doubts. What happens with the phone conversation is up for debate, or the spinning top conclusion and inception. But keep in mind this, Raylan Givens always gets his guy, especially in light of the events in City Primeval, 